Hey, what's going on, everybody? We are going to be kicking off the show in just a few seconds here. We're going to be talking about Eugene Debs today. Uh, in the meantime, please, please hit that share button, hit the like button, send the word out to all your friends that we're going to be kicking off this show in just a few minutes. Hang tight. All right. All right. Let's do it. Let's make it happen, you guys. We are doing it. We're doing the show. How you guys doing? Welcome to another Road Reflection. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Uh, if uh, if you guys are unfamiliar with the, with the show, if you're new, uh, this is a show where I talk about different news stories, different ideas, um, and I basically do this every single day except for Thursdays. Uh, that's, uh, that's my day off. That's going to be the day. Well, it's not really going to be a day off. Uh, it, it'll, it's a day where I, uh, uh, focus on other projects as well, uh, doing daily v videos where I have to do a lot of intensive research, a lot of, um, reading and videos and, and note taking, uh, and then produce the video itself is, is pretty demanding. So, um, trying to, to focus, uh, on, th so, uh, Thursdays is a day to work on other projects. So every other day there's, there's going to be a video on Fridays, which is what today is. Uh, we do Philosophy Friday, where we concentrate primarily on one uh, one idea, one one focal point. Uh, Saturdays is Storytelling Saturday, where I just tell you guys a story from my life. Uh, and on Sundays, we go live on the Facebook page. Uh, so if you're watching this on the Facebook page, make sure that you are getting notifications when these videos are going up. So there's going to be a bunch of them. Um, and, uh, and at the top of every show, we, we do a little check-in just to make sure everybody's doing okay. So if you want to, you can, you can drop a comment, uh, down below talking about how you're doing, uh, what's going on with you. What are you proud of? What accomplishments you, you want to boast about, tell the world about, uh, what, what concerns you have and, and maybe we'll address them. Uh, in 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 our uh, various topics that uh, that we talk about today, um, that that revolve around uh, one Eugene Victor Debs uh, is what we're going to be discussing. Um, but I'm doing good. I'm I'm in good spirits. Um, I feel like I'm you know my my energy is is doing pretty good for um, for what it is. I took a day off like a real day off yesterday, <laughs> which I don't very, do. I don't do that very often. Uh, I'm also not super great at it. Um, if, uh, if you've known me long enough, uh, you know that taking, taking a day off or taking anything off is not, uh, 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 uh I'm not good at it. It's just not something that I'm, I'm particularly fond of. It, it's hard for me to sit still and not like do something. Um, but I did that yesterday. I did go out and and uh, and uh, get a, you know, an, an exercise ball and, and a couple of little little things that I needed, um, and then folded my laundry. But that's about as much productivity as I did yesterday. Um, oh, and we should probably address the sunglasses again. Uh, if uh, if you're wondering, it's because I'm straining my eyeballs, guys. I'm straining my eyeballs, um, and there was a there. It, it was noticeable yesterday. It was very noticeable. Um, where I didn't stare at a computer screen all day, obviously, uh, so my eyes did reduce in puffiness, which like it, which it was like a significant puffiness apparently, uh, from looking at a screen. And some of the things that I that I looked up when you strain your eyes, um, your eyes will hurt. They'll, you'll form dark circles underneath them. Um, you'll you're more prone to headaches and migraines, and you're also more prone to like neck pain, like from the back of your neck and stuff. Uh, which is all of the things that were happening to me. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I, they basically said reduce, uh, you know, direct staring into a screen. So I'm wearing the sunglasses to reduce that. Uh, increase the font size on your computer. So I have done that as well. Uh, and nothing makes you feel older than having to, to increase the font size. I'm probably going to have to increase the font size. Uh, on my fucking phone too. That's probably gonna need to happen, and uh, and and 
it also like direct light like i have a direct light happening right here they're like don't do that a whole lot <laughs> so i've kind of had this light mostly turned away from me while i work you know into the wee hours of the of the evening um as well so um but i'm doing pretty good i feel pretty i pr feel pretty solid after the day of rest um, today has been, you know, um, pretty, pretty decent. Ha it had some, uh, a nice conversation, uh, look, got a, a very good amount of research and I feel, I feel pretty excited about talking about this topic today. Um, so, uh, yeah. And if you haven't done so already, um, if you're watching this, please share this out, give it a, give it a big thumbs up. If you're excited about the topic we're going to be covering, um, and uh, let some people know that that we're that we're doing this. And uh, as always, this is usually a pre-recorded segment, so I'm premiering it, which means that uh, you guys are watching this the this pre-recorded segment for the very first time uh, before anybody else. And uh, and you know, uh, uh, I'll be in the chats. I'll be in the chats, uh, talking to you guys, uh, responding to any comments that you guys have. Uh, so, without any further ado, let us dive into today's Road Reflection, the Philosophy Friday Road Reflection. And we're going to be talking about uh, Eugene Debs, uh, as you saw in, in our banner. Uh, you know, Eugene Debs, there he is. I'm going to turn that off, Eugene Debs. Bam! There he is. So, uh, we're going to be, we're, we're going to start with, um, I'm not going to go into like, as a boy, Eugene Debs really liked baseball. That's not, uh, I don't even know if that's actually true. Um, I'm not doing like a biographical thing. Um, but you, the reason why Eugene Debs is, is, is uh, big of a figure as he is, is because uh, Debs was an American socialist. Um, that he, he, he ran under the Socialist Party of America. How many people even knew that? How many people knew that we had a viable socialist party in America in the early 1900s? They do not teach that in schools. They don't bring that up, right? They don't, they don't talk about that. They're like, no, there were the Democrats and the Republicans, and there's never been anything more than two parties. There was one party, and then it became the two parties. At one point, somebody called themselves the Whigs. That happened for a bit, uh, and that's it. That's there's never been anything else ever in America. It's always been two parties because people have either believed in this way or that way, and that's it. That's the whole totality of human thought is this way or that way, and that's how we're taught American history to be, you know, which is ridiculous. Uh, because there have been um, various different third parties that have popped up all throughout American history, and a lot of them have have done pretty pretty damn good for themselves. Um, but Eugene Debs particularly, uh, and he had a really interesting point uh, point of view in terms of socialism, because he believed in revolutionary socialism, which we're going to get to. We're going to talk about that. Um, but let's talk about how he arrived to that conclusion. Let's talk about what led him to, to, to believe in this revolutionary socialism and what that actually means. Let's, let's, so we'll start in 1884. That's when we're going to start. In 1884, uh, Eugene Debs, Eugene Victor Debs, was elected into the Indiana House of Representatives. Uh, he was a young first-year um, uh, representative uh, from Terre Haute, Indiana. And, uh, and he was also uh, a union leader. He was the leader of the Brotherhood uh, of Locomotive Firemen. He was a union leader. That's what gave him a lot more political clout. And, and that's sort of how he um, led in the House of Representatives. He introduced a ton of bills. He introduced a bunch of bills um, you know, that specifically uh, revolved around regulating big businesses in Indiana. How are we going to regulate these big industries so that they don't get too big, so that they don't start taking advantage of the worker in, in any, you know, um, any exploitative manners? Um, if that sounds familiar, that's kind of what Bernie Sanders did with our Congress. Uh, being a democratic socialist independent within, um, within the American political system. Uh, and 
you know, let we're going to keep moving forward with with that. Now, I wanted to make that connection there, right? Uh, what what Debs is doing in the Indiana House of Representatives is essentially very similar to what Bernie Sanders is doing um, in the Senate. Um, he's an outsider. He's an outsider in what he believes in. Same with Debs. Debs was also an outsider in what he believes in, but he put forward a bunch of the stuff. He put forward a bunch of legislation in order to do that, right? And he led... Um, he led two different committees that specifically dealt with uh, uh, the railroads and corporations uh, that, that, that re in, in terms of regulating them. He led these committees. Um, and he worked to get protections specifically for railroad families. That was one of the things that he uh, uh, paved the way on. He paved the way um, in protecting families uh, of workers that worked on the railroad. Uh, because he, what, again, this is kind of touched upon in, in your history classes, maybe, maybe not. Um, but I do remember m when I was going through school that they talked about the, you know, the, the railroads being a really tough job. They were a really dangerous job. Um, so there was a lot of injuries. There was a lot of death. And when these employees died, when these workers died, the families were basically left to fend for themselves. They were basically left in financial ruin. And the way that these corporations got around it was they said, well, it's not our fault. You know what the job is. You know how dangerous it is. It's the co-worker's fault. Go, go haggle it out with them, right? So they tried to like pit people against each other, essentially, by saying that <coughs> if it wasn't for if it wasn't for the person standing next to the your your husband, um, he wouldn't have died. So you got to go talk to that family if you want restitution, if you want financial help in any 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 sort of way. Um, so Debs saw all this stuff happening, and he was like, "Well, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem like it's the right way to go about doing something like this." So he wrote various bills, pushing for uh, particularly financial help. Uh, for these working class families, um, especially, especially if you lose somebody, especially if your husband dies on the job, right? He, he wrote, like, he wrote, I think it's like House Bill 92, which specifically stated that the corporation should provide some kind of financial benefit um, to families that have seen injuries on the job or debts on the job. Uh, and he fought for employee protections. That's that's what he fought for. And the way that he made it work was he he tried to just appeal to humanity, right? One of the things this is this is what he said on the House floor. He said, "I want I want to have it so that when an employee of a railway is hurt through the negligence of a co-laborer or of the company, he may have redress from the company. The traveling public is protected." the employees should also have redress. I appeal on behalf of engineers, firemen, and the brakemen for this bill. So he basically straight up said, look, people that ride the rails get protected. Shouldn't the people that work on the rails also have some kind of protection to make sure that if they get hurt, that the company will take care of them, the company that they have given their labor to, that they have, that, that they have worked so damn hard for, uh, and unanimously in the House, it got passed. Nobody opposed it. When he made that argument in the House of Representatives in Indiana, nobody opposed it. Everybody was on board with it. And then it got to the Senate. It got to the, it, it got to the Indiana Senate. Everybody ignored it. Nobody wanted to talk about it, and it died. And this happens all the time. This happens all the time, right? This is, this is what happens in our in our giant Congress now, you know, not, not a state level thing, the federal level Congress this happens in. You got Mitch McConnell blocking bills left and right. That's, that's basically what his job is. He's the bill blocker. He's like, oh, people want protections? Fuck that shit. I got a turtle shell I got to hide in. And then he just tucks himself into his suit and it, you know, turns into a, a tur that this, he's like the, if he's not even a nin, like he's not a ninja, like he's he's the worst form of like mutant turtle uh you could possibly imagine like he's been mutated by corruption so he's like the worst kind <laughs> 
And so, I mean, so this bill just, it didn't happen. So the workers that would get hurt, that would die, their families don't have anything to, you know, so, so why would you work for a railroad company if the railroad company isn't going to help you out? You know, if, if the, if the nature of these corporations, of the workforce itself is so callous and so uncompassionate to somebody giving their life up for your company you can't take care of their like you can't give anything back to their family after they've lost a loved one and you know I'm sure there's a bunch of people that are like don't politicize the debt well what the fuck you're gonna have to do something the company's not gonna do it on their own fucking regard so now we have to make a law that that legislates compassion you shouldn't have to legislate compassion that should just be a thing that happens uh, but corporations aren't really particularly known for their compassion so after serving for one year he served for one year that was enough for him to see how corrupt this two-party system is and at this point Debs is a Democrat too Debs ran as a Democrat uh, for the House of Representatives in Indiana he won and he left he he saw how corrupt and broken the system was that these senators that let this bill die were were you know uh, big supporters of of the rail companies. They uh, either that or they were they were getting paid off by the la- uh, the rail companies and um, and he left. And then he also left the Democratic Party in doing so. And and this is this is where I think the difference of Eugene Debs and Bernie Sanders goes. Um, is two times now Bernie Sanders has run within the Democratic Party in hopes that he can drive change from within. Eugene Debs saw it in one year, in one year of serving in the Indiana Congress as a state representative. And within that year, he saw exactly how corrupt it was exactly how broken the system was and said, I can't reform it from within and I got to get the fuck out of here. Bernie Sanders is still playing that game, which is unfortunate because I like Bernie. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Bernie guy, you know? Um, I felt the burn in 2016. I felt the burn in 2020. Now I'm left singed, you know, I'm left singed. That's, that's what I am. I got a I got a couple of third degree burns. The there was backdraft that happened, and uh, this time around there was a backdraft that came back at, at at us, at the working class people, at the supporters of the Bernie movement, um, and and now, you know we gotta we gotta go with what Debs did, and said all right, this party doesn't seem like it's it's gonna support the working class person. It's it's not gonna support the the American people. So I'm going to go and uh, do something different. I'm going to have a different approach. Uh, so that was 1885. 1885, he said, I'm out, and he left. Um, he did a lot of organizing at that point, uh, became became a, 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 a labor organizer. And uh, in 1894 is the next big event uh, that takes place in Deb's, uh, Deb's career, in Deb's, in Deb's life. Uh, in 1894... Eugene Debs was was pretty much at the helm of the Pullman strikes, the Pullman Railroad Company strikes. Now, what we need to understand in terms of the uh, Pullman strikes is uh, in the south side of Chicago, uh, which currently the south side of Chicago is is um, a notor- notoriously uh, low income part of Chicago. Uh, I've been through it. And I've met some very nice people, but you know the the lesson that uh, that they take to, they they told me was you're here during the daytime, things kind of change when the sun sets. It's like all right, fair enough, um, you know. But this was in the south side of Chicago, and and the the people that were working for the Pullman Railroad Company lived in residential areas that were owned and controlled by Pullman himself. Uh, so this guy 
not only owned the railroad company, not only had a bunch of employees, but he had those employees living and paying rent in an area that that he owned. So he was kind of cashing out regardless, right? So, so all the money that he would um, pay out to his employees, he would essentially get a portion of that back by 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 rent of the buildings that he owned that he made them live in that they all had to live in they they had to live in these residential communities if you work for the Pullman Railroad Company right so all of a sudden the rents start going up and the wages start going down so this dude is cashing out double time here he's decreasing wages that these people are making and he's increasing the rents so he's getting double the fucking money and every and people were just like this is legal that's that's exactly what needs to be done. You know, he's got he's got a lot on his plate. Okay, he's making more trains, uh, and uh, you know when you when you make more trains, you got a lot of ground to break. You got to buy more shovels. What do you think? Those shovels are just coming out of nowhere. You got to pay for those shovels. Okay, if if he was allowed to just own the shovel company, this would be a different issue because then he could just uh, make one of his employees from the railroad company, buy a shovel from his shoveling company, uh, you know, and boom, biggity, biggity, boom. We're, we're not paying that much for, uh, for shovels. We improved that bottom line. That's just called business. Okay, that's just called being a genius. That's just called what you gotta do to be a good fucking American. Okay, everybody else, you're lazy. Okay, if you're not cheating the worker, you're fucking lazy. That's what you are. So, uh, reds go up, wages go down. People are getting upset. I mean, wouldn't you get upset, right? Like if your rent went up, but the the your landlord also owns the place that you work, and your rent has just gone up. And they're like, hey, we're slashing your pay. You wouldn't be upset? Come on. So at this point, um, Eugene Debs in 1893 had founded uh, one of the first uh, national industrial unions at that time. A national industrial union called the American Railway Union, the ARU. And 35% of the Pullman workers were members of the ARU. Now, this is, again, it's a fairly new labor union that, uh, that Debs had founded, right? And they were still, they were still kind of getting, getting going. They were still getting memberships. They had a bunch of members from these other railroad companies and, um, you know, and a lot of the people that were, um, that were part of the ARU were what, what they called unskilled workers, right? Uh, they weren't like the engineers or the brakemen, and um, they were the people, you know, that worked in the factories, essentially, that did, that, that kind of did some of the, the grunt work, so to speak. So Debs and the ARU went to bat for these workers, saying, hey, what you're doing isn't right. You can't be raising rents on property that you own and force your workers to live there and then also pay them less. That's crazy. Um, and uh, the Pullman company was basically like, uh, you're not real, so we don't have to listen to you, so you can go fuck yourself. Uh, and, you know, my my response to that would have immediately been, if you can touch me, I'm real, and this is a legitimate thing. These are members of the union. We're a real union. And they are like, nah, you're not. And... Uh, the Pullman Company had its own representative. It was the General Managers Association. Now, the General Managers Association is uh, basically um, who all the Karens want to see when they say, go get me a manager. They're actually talking about people from the General Managers Association who uh, are not on the side of the worker. So, you know, I don't think this should come as a surprise to anybody, but... Uh, uh, the, the Karens at large are not pro-worker. Go figure. You know, if there's anybody surprised by that, uh, I'm so sorry. Holy shit. How did you not figure that out? Did r- really the person that looks at a waiter and bitches at them and yells and complains at them 
is is not on the on the side of the working class American? Holy shit! Go figure, right? <laughs> like, oh my god, <laughs> what a surprise! Um, so Pullman Company and the General Managers Association basically look at the ARU and Debs, and they go, "You're not. We're not going to listen to you because we don't have to. You have no authority over us." Okay, you don't you don't own us, bro. We own you. We own you. That's how this works, dog. That's basically the attitude that they had. So, uh, June twenty sixth, eighteen ninety four, a hundred and twenty five thousand workers walked off the job. There's a wildcat strike. Hundred and twenty five thousand just fucking out. We're done. We don't care. We don't. We're we're not doing this shit anymore. You don't want to pay us, and you're gonna increase the rent on where we live. Fuck that noise. They saw something that was fundamentally wrong, fundamentally immoral, fundamentally not on the side of the American working class, and they looked at that shit and they were like, "We're out. We're done. This is not how we're playing the game." We tried to talk to you. You said we're not even real. You question. You don't pay. You don't treat us well, and then and then you you challenge our reality. You challenge the realness of our humanity. Fuck that shit. <clears throat> we ain't gonna play no. We ain't gonna play that game, son. One hundred twenty-five thousand workers. This is in eighteen ninety-four. Pre-internet. Pre-Twitter. Pre-email lists. They just fucking. Boom, we're done. We're done skis. Uh, now, of course, these, com- these, these railroad companies across the country that were seeing these wildcat strikes happen, uh, we're not just going to take that sleeping. They're not just going to take that laying down. So they fought back. And they brought strike breakers in. Scabs is usually what they're called, strike breakers is what, they, what they're officially referred to as. Um, and these were all black people. These were all black men that were, that were being brought in as strike breakers. And that was, um, this kind of complicated things a little bit, you know, because, um, first of all, I'm, I'm sure a lot of these, you know, black workers in 1894 who 30 years ago were not allowed to be a part of the workforce to begin with, um, are not trying to get barred out of a specific industry, right? Like, what if they join these these strikers, and then all of a sudden, in you know, eighteen ninety five rolls around, and uh, all of the railroad companies go, "Hey, uh, we're not hiring any more black people because they fucking strike. They they stood with that union, and that we said wasn't real, uh, and they said that they were, and you know, it's like, hey." We kind of gave you like three fifths of a personhood, and you should like not get in the way of that. Uh, so we're gonna take like the rest of that away from you, like you know, like that's basically what they were afraid would would happen. And you know, Congress would stand by that. Congress would be like, "Yeah, you guys just do whatever you want. You guys are great. You guys are doing so good. Look at your suit, huh? You want a shovel business? I got a shovel business that I'm not doing anything with, you know." So. They were they were nervous about it, and and the bosses essentially exploited that fear. That's what they did. Um, the you know Pullman and other railroad com- companies at that time, they exploited that fear. They basically saw the fear, and the the concerns that the black community had, and they played into it. And this is again, this is a corporate strategy that you still see today. Um, they they. They leverage that fear against the worker. They leverage that fear to to try to use your identity to kind of divide us a little bit more. Um, and so, what are you supposed to do, right? If if it, in this specific case, how do you kind of maneuver around that? It's very difficult. It's very difficult to maneuver around that. So Eugene Debs uh, basically said, "We're going to host a a peaceful meeting." Um, and, and and just talk through this. We're going to talk through what our rights are. Well, eventually mob rule took over uh, after this after this peaceful meeting and uh, shit started getting violent. 
And uh, as this is sort of happening, on the western side of the country, uh, there was a ton of sympathy strikes. The western states were having a ton of sympathy strikes uh, on their railroads as well. So obviously the movement was building. You know, things were getting bigger. This was this this was looking like it might head towards a, a, a large general strike. So there was a federal injunction put into place. And uh, Debs was like, oh, remember how you said we're not real? Um, we don't have to listen to your injunction if we're not real. So he ignored it. He was just like, uh, your, your real laws don't work with imaginary people. And he just fucking, you know. Uh, so uh, Grover Cleveland, who was the Republican president at the time, uh, used the army to enforce this injunction. Uh, once again, right? We're, this guy's basically like, yo, I'm civil disobedience, I'm peaceful. Um, I'm, I'm trying to rectify these people that got violent. I'm trying not to get them to do that again. Uh, there's a bunch of other peaceful demonstrations happening all across the country. Um, and what's the response to that? The response to that is, ah, but we're, we're, we say you're going to be violent. Because maybe, I don't know, so we're going to be violent towards, that's what I do. I get violent. You know what I mean? As the president of the United States, you know, whenever I whenever I meet a force that disagrees with me, my my first uh, thought is, how can I kill it? Not let me talk to it, you know. T ask Mexico. They were like, hey, we disagree with you on this being your land, and we were like, oh yeah, well I got a whole army, and they were like, wait a minute, what's happening? And then. Everybody died, and I won the argument. So, ask me if I've ever lost a debate. You can't, because anybody that's tried to debate me, I set their house on fire. That's how I win debates. Because, you know, what you can't debate against? Arson. And then I say that you burned your own house down, and what are they going to say? They're homeless. They're crazy. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? That's great. Like, that's how... The, that's the United States mentality right there. They called in the army when the dude was like, I'm going to be peaceful and just try to talk this shit out. Uh, I don't see your injunction as real because you're, you're not going to... I mean, are you going to say that I'm a real union? That means that the railroad company has to negotiate with me now, <laughs> right? So as this injunction goes out, Eugene Debs and the American Railway Union call for a general strike, and they look for support from some of the more larger, more established unions, right, like the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, which was a lot more established at the time. And uh, and all the other unions were like, eh, nah, bro, we don't want to, this is not what we want to do. We don't really want to take your side for some reason, um, which is very confusing to me. Like, when I read that, I was, like, really confused about it. Um and, and we're seeing that today, too. You know, we, we do have certain union groups that are looking at the wildcat strikes that, that are going on today in our society. Um, and they're looking at it and, and saying, well, we don't really agree that this is the right time to do it when this is absolutely 100% the right time to do it. Um, because any time that a strike even happens, it's the right time to fucking do a strike. And if you're a union, you should fucking be on their side. If you're a member of a union, you should be on their side. You should have sympathy strikes. You should have solidarity strikes. Um, but the AFL was like, nah, we're not going to support Debs, right? And as a result, uh, the army used the force. They, they used their own force to break up a lot of the strikes that were happening across the country. Um, so there was a bunch of organized strikes and the army went in and used force and used violence uh, to, to essentially break the strikes up, which is very unfortunate to see. Um, and as the violence escalated, because once the army pushed back on them, the strikers pushed back on the army, uh, 30 strikers got killed, 57 were injured, and $80 million in property damage was done. $80 million. That's what they lost, right? That's what the elites end up losing in all this. They end up losing money. But the strikers and the workers end up losing their lives. 
And these people, these, these fucking elites will sit there and say that our dollar sign is worth more than the lives of these other people. You can just make up more money. That's what you do. You make up more money. You can't just bring a human life back. You can't bring that one specific human life back. And that's, that, and that's how they think. So, um, there was a Methodist preacher named uh, J.W. Jenning. Um, and he points out, uh, he points this out. Let me see if I can find that screen capture. First, he says uh, that the party leaders were pliant tools of the codfish moneyed aristocracy who seek to dominate this country. I mean, you could, you could say that that's still true today, that these corporations only care about their bottom line. They only care about their money. You know, they don't care about safety of their, of their consumers or their employees. If you if if they did, then Amazon would have immediately, oh, somebody got tested positive of this virus, this pandemic that we're in. Yeah, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna shut the warehouse down. We're gonna give everybody paid uh, paid sick leave for two weeks, and we're gonna fucking just redo the whole facility. Every other business that I have seen is like, hey, there's a pandemic. We're working on limited hours with limited employees. Uh, we're all working from home, so things are kind of different. So be patient, you know, but not Amazon. They're like, no, we want, you know what we're going to do? We're going to send you your package within 38 seconds of you clicking that button. And if it's not, then we, you get to punch one of our workers. How about that? Is that good? Are you guys happy? Are you guys? And, and then we'll actually give you, you can give us $5 to punch a second worker too. You guys good? That's pretty good. That's pretty solid. That's a great business plan. That's what they do. They care more about their, their moneyed interests than they do the people. That's how it works. He also goes on to say uh, that rather than defending the rights of the people against the aggression and uh, uh, against the aggression and oppressive corporations, that's what the government has chosen to do. That that President Cleveland, this dude got fucking elected twice, man. People elected this fucking guy twice. They were like, this guy's a good president. This guy's great. He really likes murdering average people. That, that's what we like to see in a president. <laughs> they were just like, we'll, we'll, we'll bring him back at some point. He defended the corporation. Again, we see that again, right? 2008, who got bailed out? Banks. 2020, who got bailed out? Banks. We're all fucking stuck here. So what did the public support look like for this strike? Um, wasn't great. They were, uh, they were swayed more by the, the media and the rich. And the rich were running a propaganda campaign to essentially make, um, make these strikers and make the American Railway Union look bad. And one of the ways that they did it is by making them look greedy. They were, they, were, they were making Eugene Debs, who was going to bat for the American worker, for unskilled workers, right? The quote-unquote unskilled workers, which I, I don't even like that term. Um, they, they were like, this guy's trying to fucking turn a buck. That's what he's trying to do. It's like, what? You own where these people live, man. <laughs> And you own where they work. You own every piece of their life. And now you're trying to take more of their wealth and you have the audacity to call the person fighting on their behalf greedy. Fucking crazy. And then the public was just like, yeah, it seems right. It seems right that this fucking gazillionaire is... Nobody's thought about, nobody's thought about this guy, you know? Have they thought about his millions of forks that he needs to own? The fuck? Like, like that, and that still happens today. That's how, they, that's how they push back against unions. That's how they push back against these strikers. You have assholes like Ben Shapiro on his show screaming about hazard pay 
and how you should just do it for the glory of work. That's not how your fucking system works. Your precious capitalism. I mean, it is. Your precious capitalism is based on greed and doesn't give a shit about people. But aren't you supposed to get paid for what you do? Under capitalism? Isn't that how it fucking is supposed to work out? That's how they fucking make this work. They make they make the strikers who are asking for uh, a better work condition, safer work conditions, and to be paid appropriately. They make them look greedy. Jeff Bezos has a hundred and sixty five billion dollars. Bill and Melinda Gates are fucking multi billionaires. You think Tim Cook from Apple? Isn't fucking super rich? The guys that own Instacart, Lyft, Uber, these people are fucking billionaires. But they're not greedy. They're not greedy. For wanting more by cutting, you know, employees' pay. Putting them in dangerous conditions. They're not greedy. It's the people that actually want to be treated like human beings. How dare you? (laughs) <laughs> That's how the public in 1894 was conned into not being on the side of the worker. And that's the same tactic that they use, what, over over 120 years later? So what happened to Eugene Debs? Uh, Eugene Debs, um, they, they charged him with a bunch of stuff including conspiracy. And that one didn't particularly stick um, because his lawyers, I think Clarence Darrow, um, who was like a super famous lawyer at the time, um, he basically said, well, he had public meetings. Like he was talking, he was making public speeches. So where was his conspiracy at? You know, like he was advocating for the worker publicly. Everybody knew where he stood. It was the corporations, it was the rail companies that were acting in secret that conspired against their workers. They didn't have public meetings to say that they were going to increase the rent and cut the wages. They went in secret to the president. Uh, so the conspiracy charge was dropped, but they did, um, they kind of gave him like treasonous charges and stuff because uh, he went against that federal injunction and, uh, and he was put in prison for six months. Uh, so in 1895, He was put in prison for six months. So uh, that brings us to the end of the century. And um, Eugene Debs created the Socialist Party of America. That's right. America had a Socialist Party. Um, in, In 1900, he created this. And he ran for president five times. Five times under the Socialist party of America. Now, uh, even in 1900, this was an incredibly misunderstood term. Um, It's been a misunderstood term since the inception of the term socialism. Debs ran under the idea of revolutionary socialism. And what does that mean? That means that the worker is not just a constituency. Um, It's they're they're not like a they're not somebody that he's trying to get votes from Um, to Debs for real fundamental and transformational change that is going to come directly from the worker. They were on the foreground of this radical movement. They were on the foreground of this revolution where it wasn't going to come from legislative efforts. It's going to come from the workers themselves, uh, not just seizing the means of their own production, but seizing the means of their life, that they were in control of their own destinies, that they didn't need the party bosses. They didn't need any boss, period, to tell them what to do, how to go about their day, 
what the society needed, that was all going to be de determined by we the people. So fundamentally, this revolutionary socialist idea was kind of what the idea of this country was supposed to be. That we were, that, that we're all self-determining. That we know where this country needs to go and we're going to take action to get it that way rather than a government system right rather than um rather than than people in congress and senate that are going to make rules on our behalf when they never do they've never made rules on our behalf and and anytime the rules are made on our behalf there are always these half measures with these incredibly massive compromises to them So that's what he did. He created the, boom, Socialist Party of America. In 1901, he publishes a, 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 a paper uh, called How I Became a Socialist. And this is what he said in it. He said, the combined corporations were paralyzed and helpless. At this juncture, they were delivered from wholly unexpected quarters a swift succession of blows that blinded me for an instant and then opened my eyes. And in the gleam of every bayonet and the flash of every rifle, the class struggle was revealed. This was my first practical lesson in socialism, though wholly unaware that it was called by that name. An army of detectives, thugs, and murderers were equipped with badge and beer and bludgeon and turned loose. Old hulks of cars were fired. The alarm bells tolled. The people were terrified. The most startling rumors were set afloat. The press volleyed and thundered. And over all the wires sped the news that Chicago's white throat was in the clutch of a red mob. Injunctions flew thick and a fast arrest followed and our office and headquarters the heart of the strike was, was sacked torn out and nailed up by the quote-unquote lawful authorities of the federal government and when in company with my loyal comrades i found myself in cook county jail at chicago with the whole press screaming conspiracy treason murder and by some fateful coincidence I was given a cell occupied just previous to his execution by the assassin of Mayor Carter Harrison Sr. Overlooking the spot a few feet distant from anarchists were hanged a few years before. And I had another exceedingly practical and impressive lesson in socialism. So he basically points out exactly what the Pullman strike did. They attacked him. They shot at him. Uh, they took violent retaliatory actions against him. And, you know, yeah, all he was trying to do was stand up for the working class person. Um, and that was the lesson. That when you have these beliefs, you're going to have a bunch of um, state-driven violence towards you. Um, and like I said, he ran for the ticket he, w with these beliefs in mind, with, with these stories that he shares. Um, you know... He ran for president five times uh, and did fairly well, too. Did fairly well. Uh, one of the provisions that he had, and this is another thing that is going to set him apart from Bernie Sanders, is that he refused to endorse any candidate uh, that was pro-capitalist. Which, I mean, this is an idea that was radical in 1902, as it is in 2002, as it is in 2020, and as it probably will be in 2022. <laughs> I mean, this is a radical idea. He was just like, no, if you're pro-capitalist, if you're pro a bunch of fucking people at the top making money and exploiting the labor of other people, then I'm not going to fucking endorse your campaign. So... I mean, the Democratic Party was scared of him because they were like, wait a minute, you're not going to bend at the knee when we need you to, when we want you to, when we're trying to take your constituents away from you? You're not just going to tell them to vote for us? That's crazy. Lesser of two evils, bro. 
Lesser of two evils still means you're voting for evil. So, you know, and, and this, is, this is the difference from Bernie Sanders, is he still supports capitalists. And that's an unfortunate thing. Bernie Sanders endorsed Hillary Clinton. He's a big fan of Barack Obama and, and Al Gore and spoke out against Ralph Nader, and, which was uh, all disappointing. He doesn't really say anything about, um, you know, uh, third parties like the Green Party who share a lot of very similar values to what Bernie Sanders should and share a lot of similar values to, uh, you know, uh, Eugene Debs, for that matter. Um, and that's upsetting. It really is. Um, as somebody that supports Bernie Sanders and thinks that he's probably a very good guy and he's probably a very nice individual and really gives a shit about the working class, it just sucks that he has to bend at the knee and support these capitalists that don't care about us, that don't want to legislate on our behalf, you know, that don't want to fight for us on that level. And, and, and not supporting them and, and coming out and, and criticizing them for what they are and criticizing the system that they represent is as radical of an idea in 1902 as it is in 2020. And Debs also called out the duopoly. Uh, this is a 1904 speech. Uh, this is a quote from a 1904 speech. He says, the Republican and Democratic parties, or to be more exact, the Republican Democratic Party represents the capitalist class in the class struggle. They are the political wing of the capitalist system, and such differences as arise between them relate to spoils and not to principles. With either of those parties in power, one thing is always certain, and that is that the capitalist class is in the saddle and the working class under the saddle. He basically points out that both parties are run by the same thing. Same things Jennings called out. <clears throat> that Methodist preacher. <sighs> called out that your Republicans are run by money. Democrats are run by money. That's in fucking 1904. None of that is that much different today. That's how, that's how fucking long these two parties have been corrupt for. And let's not forget the beginning of all this, too. 1884, we were looking at bills that were going to help the working class, both the Republicans and the Democrats at that time, were like, nah, we're just not going to fucking, we're not going to consider that. That's crazy. There are people giving us money right now. And that's, <laughs> that's how they operate. They've been operating like this for so fucking long. And some people don't realize that, right? Some people don't see that. You, you, you have a lot of people that sit there and say, well, well you know, and, and they said this in 2016. They said this when Ralph Rader was running. They read, said this when Ross Perot was running. They said this when McGovern became the fucking Democratic no a candidate. Is there's a time for idealism and there's a time for pragmatism. No, I think that... It's, they're the same fucking thing. Idealism and pragmatism are the same fucking thing. This is an insane political system. This is an insane system run by rich people that convince a bunch of poor people that one party is better than the other when they fucking have their hands up the ass puppeting both parties. And Eugene Debs just called him out for it in a viable viable socialist party in the early 1900s. And he all, and I mean, this was like a constant thing that he would, he would go and challenge these capitalist candidates, right? Uh, where are we at? Hold on. Let me make sure. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for technical difficulty here, <laughs> but he would challenge it. So this is from a 1908 speech. Uh, he said the radical and the progressive elements of the former democracy have been evicted and must seek other quarters. They were an unmitigated nuisance in the conservative councils of the old party. They were for the common people and the trusts have no use for such a party. Where but to the socialist party can these progressive people turn? 
every true Democrat should thank Wall Street for driving them out of a party that is, on, that is democratic in name only and into one that is democratic in fact. Boom. Oh, 1908. 1908, he basically says the party, the name of the party is false. They don't actually represent any sort of democratic values. And they fucking don't. They just don't. True Bernie Sanders supporters, true people, the, the people that really believed in what, what Bernie had to say, diehard Bernie supporters, should not be bending at the knee. My opinion should not be bending at the knee of the Democratic Party to support a corporate candidate. Not a chance. There are a bunch of other options that you can choose that nobody's talking about, right? I mean, he may, Eugene Debs is basically making a plea to say, come join us at the Socialist Party, and we promise that we will actually be a voice that represents you, that we will do everything in our power to make sure that you are represented. We will go to, we will go to bat for you. That's what he, that's what he's advocating for. And I think that's, I mean, that's essentially what virtually every third party is advocating for. And people sit there and say, no, it's not practical. <laughs> and, and supporting a party that for, what, 200 years has been pulling the same shit is practical? I just don't understand that argument. I mean, in 1908, we're making this case. And the case hasn't changed because the problem hasn't changed. <laughs> it's the same problem. And we're saying, can we try this one little thing that's different? Come join the Socialist Party. Come join this party that actually believes, uh, it matches your belief systems. Rather than you having to curtail what you believe in to, to make a vote for something that, you know, doesn't even feel right. Why would you take something as, as precious as voting, as, as having your voice count in, in, in this larger system that, it, you know, it, this sacred thing that's delivered to you, that, that you just ha you're just granted that right and give that power over to somebody that is not going to match your beliefs, is not going to really represent you. This is from a 1911 speech um, when he was up against uh, Woodrow Wilson on the left. He says this, Eugene Debs, uh, we should seek to register the actual vote of socialism. No more, no less. In our propaganda, we should state our principles clearly, speak the truth fearlessly, seeking neither to flatter nor to offend, but only to convince those who should be with us and win them to our cause through an intelligent understanding of its mission. This is what we're, this is what we need to be doing. We need to be creating a coalition. We need to be creating a party that is actually for the people. There are people that are doing that. Movement for the People's Party is doing that. Uh, that they, they've merged with Burn the DNC. There's uh, uh, there's the DSA. There's there's Green Party. There's a lot of people that are doing that that are trying to create a coalition. They're trying to create a party. And anybody that's a true progressive should be joining these movements and pushing back against a Democratic Party that has refused to represent them. So we go on. Voting for socialism is not socialism any more than a menu is a meal. Socialism must be organized, drilled, equipped, and the, pl and the place to begin is in the industries where the workers are employed. 
without such economic organization and the economic power with which it is closed and without the industrial cooperative training, discipline, and efficiency, which are its corollaries, the fruit of any political victories in the worker may achieve will turn to ashes on their lips. It's talking about solidarity right there. Um, that we need to we need to be in solidarity with each other. Uh, which can be hard. Sometimes people are frustrating. But at the end of the day, the bigger goal is to empower ourselves. To know that we're living in a system that truly doesn't represent us. You had these, finally now, a bunch of these major, uh, you know, uh, pro-worker activists were, were giving Debs this credit. You know, Bill Haywood, Mother Jones, they all started supporting Debs. These are international workers, uh, inter IWW, international workers. God, I can't remember what the second W is. Um, but these these labor these these large figures from the labor movement were supporting Debs. In 1912, um, Debs took six percent of the vote. Six percent. It's a million people. One million people voted for the Socialist Party of America. One million people were basically stood up and said, "Yeah, I'm for this." I don't believe in what the Democratic Party is saying. In 1912, in 1912, this was happening. Can you imagine if this happened today? Can you imagine if there was a, a, a like a viable third party like the Socialist Party of America? And he wasn't the only one, right? The Bull Moose Party um, that Teddy Roosevelt ran uh, against Grover Cleveland. Um, that was also happening at the same time. Now, after the 1912 election, 6% of the vote, by the way, 6% of the vote. That's nothing to fucking laugh at. It's a million people. That's nothing to laugh at right there. Um, in, in 1912, too, that's, that, that's a significant amount. Um, and I bet you that at that point, too, like he's not getting on the radio, you know, He's he's doing speech. He's doing on the ground kind of shit, you know. Um, he I think he was he was traveling by train. He was traveling by train, city to city, doing these speeches. Uh, and after 1912, the group starts to splinter a little bit, and you know you have this revolutionary socialist idea of the worker being at the forefront. That it's not this top-down government system. That it's this solidarity, this non-hierarchical system where we are all determining our own futures. Uh, they had a bunch of racists that started showing up in the in the socialist movement, um, and Debs pushed back against them. He he didn't really want them to be the representatives of the socialist party. Uh, and eventually, in 1918, um, we get to the the one of the most famous. Uh, speeches that Debs gives. It's over two hours long. Um, I will be honest that I have not read the whole speech. I want to. It, it's a it's a long it's a long fucking speech, you guys. Uh, and and oh boy, only has so much time in a day. Uh, but I have heard uh, segments and parts of the speech that uh, really got him in trouble. And in 1918, in the Canton, Ohio speech. Um, he basically points out that the ruling class uses the subject class or the working class as cannon fodder for their wars. It was a huge speech that was super against World War I. That, all of it. Not just being like, America shouldn't be involved. Or, it was just like, why the fuck are we fighting wars when all wars are is, a, is, is, is the middle class being used as cannon fodder for the rich. Uh, that's not cool. you know. And, he point, and one of the things he points out is is the subject class doesn't determine the uh, the uh, the treaties. We don't determine when peace is declared, and we don't determine when war is declared. That's all done through, um, you know, the elites, the the robber barons, the bosses. 
they're the ones that determine all this stuff and and that's what they do you know and again that's something else um that we still see today name one time name one time where the working class has actually determined whether we need to go to war or not name one time that the working class has actually determined what the 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 negotiations of peace should be what are we going to get out of it right if if america won the war where are we on the negotiating table of peace it's never happened even 911 right you'd be like oh well everybody wanted to take down terrorists in 911 krish that was important was it was that you did you guys make that decision was there a vote was there a national vote that was called in or did somebody just say well terrorists want to kill your family and eat your babies and you were like well you got to go to yeah kill whoever you need to also take some of my freedoms do you want a couple of them because we'd love to give you um, a, a lot of them also we're going to turn to be super xenophobic but we're going to be like we're not really racist okay we just want safety so we have to punch all brown people in the testicles and that's how you prevent terrorism from happening i'm doing my part we're going to do that that was the decision they made that decision they used fear as a way to just get into an illegal war again so that's what the core of of that 1918 speech was it was this immensely anti-war speech And two weeks later, he was arrested for violating the Espionage Act, which is an act put into place by Democrat Woodrow Wilson, good old Democrat, violating the Constitution, because the Espionage Act basically says that you can't say shit about the American military. You can't say anything uh, about not going to war during a wartime. You can't say anything bad about the military. You can't say anything bad about uh, the government or anything. Uh, And that goes against freedom of speech, expression, petitioning the government, and peacefully assembling, which is what he was doing. In 1918, there was an assembly. This wasn't at, like, this was at a rally that they had gotten together. And you arrested somebody for expressing their opinions. That's authoritarian. And a Democrat put that into place. Ten years is what his sentence was for pointing out the reality that the working class people are used as cannon fodder for the rich and we've never been involved in peace talks or declaring war. And maybe we fucking should. If you're gonna use us as cannon fodder, maybe you should ask us whether we, we need to be in war or not. But in prison from the Atlanta penitentiary, he ran for president again in 1920 He ran as inmate number 9653, garnering another 1 million votes. He got another million votes from prison. If he would have ran, if he would have ran at like without being in prison, imagine how many votes he would have gotten. Imagine if he wasn't handicapped by being in prison for no fucking reason, by being a victim of of, uh, a, a unconstitutional law. He would have fucking wiped the floor. America would have been so different. If he would have fucking won, if he would have given Woodrow Wilson a run for his money at that point. Holy shit, dude. Holy fucking shit. One of the, one of the big fights that he uh, put forward was a fight for prisoner rights. Right. So he gets out of prison. Um, in 1926. He, uh, uh, he fights for racial equality against white supremacy. He, he penned a, um, an, an op-ed piece, essentially, um, about a, a hanging that happened in Kentucky of, uh, of a black man. Um, and, you know, one of the things he points out was uh, capital punishment is delivered a lot quicker to black men than it is white men. And, you know, that there is Christian white supremacy in this country. 1926, he's calling out all this shit. Again, we still see these problems today. We're still seeing a lot of this shit today. And he was calling that out. Had we been a more... Had we gone with with a president like him? 
instead of instead of uh, Mr. Espionage Act, Democrat Espionage Act, maybe we wouldn't be as paranoid of a country willing to give up our rights for illegal wars as we are now. I don't know. Maybe we wouldn't have a a, a, a system that has prisons for profits. Maybe we wouldn't have a system that uh, convicts more black men for nonviolent crimes than white people. <laughs> Maybe we would be able to accept that we have Christian white supremacy. And, and uh, the biggest example of that is white Jesus. Dude, Jesus was in the Middle East. He would be my shade of skin color. That's right. Y'all worship a brown socialist. Uh, he died later in 1926 of cardiovascular problems that he developed um, from his time in prison, uh, is what it said. And uh, oh, this guy fought for a lot of things that, that we still see today. Um, I think... He is a, uh, he's not taught about, talked about in history classes. Um, he's not really talked about a, in, you know, the, the only reason we know about him, I, you know, is because of Bernie Sanders. And I, I, I will give credit where credit is due. Uh, and this should be part of our history. You can't talk about World War I without talking about Eugene Debs and Woodrow Wilson and the Espionage Act. Kids in school need to learn about this shit. They do. And, that, and, and the reality is that they won't because what this teaches you is to stand up for your rights. What this teaches you is that uh, sometimes your leaders are flat out fucking wrong. And, they ha and it doesn't matter what party they belong to. Because guess what? Eugene Debs went to, went to bat for the working class man against a Democrat, Woodrow Wilson, who put him in prison... And a Republican who also put him in prison. And that's how both parties operate. So what is the difference? There's no difference. They both are corporate parties. And they have been for over 200 years. Why are we still supporting them? So that's a question. That's a very difficult question to answer, right? There are, op op there are opportunities and options out there. Um, that are a little bit different. And I'm going to end uh, uh, today with reading two different quotes uh, from Eugene Debs. Um, this first one is, uh, Too long have the workers of the world waited for some Moses to lead them out of bondage. He has not come. He will never come. I would not lead you out if I could. For if I could be, it, for if you could be led out, you could be led back again. It would not have you make up your minds that there is nothing you cannot do for yourselves. You do not need the capitalist. He could not exist in an instant without you. You would, not, you would just begin to live without him. You do not need everything, and he has everything. And some of you imagine that if it were not for him, you would not... Ha you, you would have no work. As a matter of fact, he does not employ you at all. You employ him to take from you what you produce, and he faithfully sticks to hit this task. If you cannot stand it, he can. And if you don't change this relation, I am sure he won't. You make the automobile, he rides in it. If it were not for you, he would walk. And if it were not for him... You would ride. It's very important because that's basically saying stop looking for the one leader, right? Same thing as him saying uh, a, a vote for socialism is not socialism in and of itself. So just because you brought it into the mainstream political conversation doesn't mean that you have brought socialism into the world. You have to continue fighting for it and that fight only exists if you let it power given to these capitalists comes from us letting these capitalists do exactly what they want 
um, and not holding them accountable, not holding their feet to the fire, not saying, you know, we're, we're not going to fucking take that shit anymore. And this is what he says is the future for socialism. Under socialism, no man will depend upon another for a job or upon self-interest or good uh, goodwill of another for a chance to earn bread for his wife and child. No man will work to make a profit for another to enrich an idler, for the idler will no longer own the means of life. No man will be an economic dependent, and no man need feel the pinch of poverty that robs life of all joy and ends finally in the county house, the prison, and the potter's field. Industrial self-government social democracy will completely revolutionize the community life. For the first time in history, the people will be truly free and rule themselves. And when this comes to pass, poverty will vanish like the mist before the sunrise. When poverty goes out of the world, the prison will remain only as a monument to the ages before light dawned upon darkness and civilization came to mankind it's very powerful a lot of what he talks about in that um, some of it has been addressed with uh, resource-based economy and and the zeitgeist movement and the venus project um, i did a big video thing about them you should, if you guys want to go look that up i'll probably end up talking about those again at some point he's talking about no hierarchy, but finding true definitive purpose in what your life is as, as a person, as a human. His revolutionary socialism idea is a humanist idea. Is an idea that says that we don't need to be interdependent on each other for financial gain or employment or whatever, we can all be an encouraging force to help each other find our own purpose in this world. <clears throat> Which is very important because I don't think that's the way that, that we run our world. I think finding purpose, finding meaning in our lives and in what we do how we can be a contributing member of society is far more important than trying to um, acquire wealth and make a shit ton of money all the time. Um, that's a completely different way of thinking. And it's a less profit-driven way of thinking. And that's really what Eugene Debs represents. This guy was around 100 plus years ago and has more progressive ideologies than a lot of uh, people that claim to be progressive. Um, how do we achieve this is going to be up to us. And the first step is uh, coalescing as a community, standing in solidarity with each other, realizing that we have the power and realizing that sometimes doing things uh, for for just the good of humanity good and the good of community is more important than trying to make a profit off of that good. That doing something truly good is not a, not a bottom line incentive or a profit incentive. Doing good for humanity is just that. It's doing good for humanity and it should just be left at that. If that appeals to you, then guess what? You might be a revolutionary socialist. All right, folks. Thank you for uh, tuning in. This was a this was a bit of a long one, huh? <laughs> um, uh, it didn't feel it didn't feel that that long to me, uh, to be honest. I'm looking at the recording time now, and and I'm I'm a little little surprised as to how long it was. Time flies when you're taking down the oligarchy and 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 bringing a uh, little little humanism to the people, I guess. Um, but thank you guys for, for watching. Um, if you enjoyed this, um, by the way, I, every, everything, I, I mean what I say. I, I try to live uh, by, by 
what I say on on these videos and uh, and if if uh, at any point I'm not uh, and uh, you know you see that happening if if you if you see me not living by what I'm saying on these videos in my stand up um, in the things that I'm I'm writing and producing and putting out there into the world some of this stuff is a reminder to me and sometimes I need you guys to call me out on it. Right. Some, sometimes it's like I put something out there and you go, hey, that's not very compassionate or what have you. Um, please do. And then please quote me. If you quote me back to me, I will uh, listen. Or, or if you quote something that Eugene Deb said uh, back to me that I, you know, I'm, I'm definitely going to be. Um, but, oh, shit. I got to change my approach to this thing. But, um, yeah, if you guys enjoyed this, um, like I said, every Friday we're going to be doing we're going to be picking a topic of philosophy um, and uh, and kind of taking a look at it, um, you know, through history and this historical lens. Um, I like doing that. I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of uh, of history and there's so much there. Um, so, yeah, please share this out with some people. Um, hit the like button uh, and. Uh, what else? Oh, if you have the ability to donate, um, uh, please do over at uh, ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. You can become a sustaining member or make a one-time donation. Um, it's not mandatory. All of this stuff is available for free to everybody to, to just listen and enjoy if that's uh, what you want to do. Um, my albums are available on my website as well. Uh, and if you go to Bandcamp, they're available as pay what you want. Uh, so, uh, you can get them for free if, if money's tight and things are, uh, things are difficult, but you still want to enjoy some socially conscious comedy. Um, all of them are available there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of stuff to, to do and enjoy. And, um, I'll be back tomorrow with, with Storytelling Saturday, uh, which is, which I, I have a cool, fun little story for you guys as well. Um, that I'm excited about that I'm going to be going live on Sunday. So make sure you guys are tuned into the Facebook, uh, Facebook event page, the Facebook, uh, page page. Um, and, uh, and we'll see you guys soon. Thank you again. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying these, uh, these dives into like the strikes and, uh, talking about these old socialist ideas and solidarity and stuff. Like I genuinely believe in that sort of stuff. So, um, I hope you guys are enjoying it. Uh, cause I'm going to keep doing it because <laughs> I feel like it's the right thing to do right now, uh, is remind everybody that we can come together and we have come together and we have won and we can continue pursuing, um, you know, where let, let's pick up where Deb's left off. Maybe, maybe that's the way to go. Um, I don't know. I don't know, but I, but I think it's important to, to know this history. It's important to to see this history because, uh, uh, I can tell you that, you know, the oligarchs, the people that currently run this system don't want you to know this information. Anyway, um, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you again, uh, to all the people that have already donated and become sustaining members and patrons and all that stuff. Uh, the people that watch this, um, on a regular basis, the people that share this on a regular basis. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. Um, stay well, stay safe, um, and, uh, be good to each other. Take care of each other. We'll see you tomorrow.